Hello everyone, welcome to the Desolation Sounds podcast. My name is Stephen Hook and this is a podcast celebrating everything to do within the world of alternative music, be that rock, punk, metal or extreme metal. Coming up on this week's show, loads of new music from the likes of Issues of Mice and Men, Jamie Lemon, Oathbreaker and Where Your Wounds. News coming from, st- uh, not Stone Sour, hell yeah, but kind of Stone Sour as well. Finally, some tool news, some actual tool, tool news. Uh, Mastodon Sepultura, Sepultura also get a shout out as well. And album reviews this week come from Oakley Doakley, Brutus, La Dispute, and the open mic goes to The Defile and their debut album, Grave Times. As with everything else on the Station Podcast in the past, we're going to start off with the news. Uh, Roy Mayorga, the drummer of Stone Sour, remember them from about 30 seconds ago, uh, it's been announced that he will be joining Hell Yeah on tour for their, well, their upcoming tour, duh. Uh, he'll be filling in the gap left behind by Vinnie Paul, who sadly passed away sometime last year, and will be part of their, as from what I read and from what I understand, he will be part of their upcoming tour, or doing their upcoming tour dates, and I imagine they've said... The new Hell yeah album will feature drum parts from Paul. Um, and I imagine any gaps left behind or any like demos that need to be flushed out more and more, I imagine Roy will fill in the gaps, I guess, in a nice... I don't know if there's a nice way to put that, but yeah, Roy Mayoga, now part of Hell yeah as a... I believe at the moment just as a touring member. I don't think... It's a weird one, because given the circumstances... It's weird to decipher and to figure out how everything fits into everything, but there we go. Uh, news broke, I think it was yesterday or day before, that Tool have finally confirmed the release date for their new album. Uh, we're coming out on the 30th of August. Uh, they announced it they, when, in a recent live show they, where they've been playing new music anyways. Um, I think the show finished off. They left the uh, stage... And the backdrop or the Titan Tron was just a 30th of August release date plastered across the screen. Excuse me. And they updated various social media, including Facebook and Twitter, to reflect that. So we might, well, it looks like we have finally got our Tool album. But who knows? With Tool, it might just be one big troll and they might be releasing something else. Who the fuck knows? I just want it to come out so that people will shut up. Uh, Elsewhere in the news, you've got Mastodon working on album number six. Album number six, fucking can't read. Album number eight, even, following their summer tour with Cody and Cambria. And Sepultura are aiming for a February 2020 release date, because that is prior planning. Uh, Release date for February 2020, and we'll hit the studio this coming August. If it sounds like I'm rushing through things, it's because I don't have much time. People are coming home soon. I've only got half an hour. We'll see if this works. Having said that, there's fucking loads of new music that's come out the past seven days. Uh, we'll start with Local Boys Deliverer, and they've got a new song out called Caution. It is so far unattached to an album, but I, from my very, very close sources, there is an album on the way, and it sounds fucking incredible like holy shit it is i reviewed their illuminate ep which came out it was last year uh yeah that was the first thing the first album i'd ever properly reviewed i reviewed it for what culture and it was of them deliver as a band they are a very techy uh borderline gent metalcore band they also had a, I don't want to quite say a groove metal, or new metal, sorry. I think it is more like a groove sort of bounce in the background, but it was perfectly serviceable, and I, um, you know, considering what it was, I did quite enjoy it. With the new song, Caution, it sounds like a huge improvement from that. Jack, lead singer, uh, lead singer his screams so sound, sound so much stronger now, there's too many S's. Um, Willem, their drummer who also employs backing vocals. His clean sound, huge in it as well. And the outgoing chorus, you've got both Jack and Will just slamming out this huge note together, and it sounds fucking huge. Um, So yeah, I've gone from mildly excited to very excited to find out what happens next for Deliverer. They are local to Lincoln. They play 
a lot around the Nottingham, Sheffield and Lincoln areas. So if you get the chance, support small music and yeah, go go tell them I said hi. Issues have released a new song and it's called Tapping Out. That's their first song without Michael Bohm. Hope that's how you pronounce his name. Um, still a lot of like R&B, new metalcore kind of thing going on. I've seen a lot of people critiquing this as why aren't they heavy anymore and they've lost like a big part of their sound. But I don't get it. It sounds, if anything, it sounds like more like a raw metalcore sound than what I know from the debut. Um, it still has harsh vocals throughout the breakdown and like some pretty good harshes as well. They depending on how the rest of the album goes, might even surpass Michael in terms of just how good they are. Uh, the bass in the bra- uh, yeah, the bass in the breakdown sounds juicy as fuck. Um, if anything, my complaints go to a lot of the synthy R&B sound, which made issues stand out a lot from everyone else with their, like, like Tyler Carter. It's so, issues are so R&B now that Tyler Carter has gone on to do a solo r and I know there's an EP. I think there might be an album as well. I'm not too, 100% sure. But yeah, a lot of that has gone. And like I said, it used to be so prominent in the music. Now it's kind of shifted quite the way to the back. I'm unsure. I am very unsure about it all. I think... Obviously, it's difficult to pass judgment. I know I've just said Caution from Deliver was great, but it's hard to um, pass judgment on an entire album. So I'll be looking forward to what will be album number three. And yeah, I think I'll still give a listen because it's issues and they they always like to keep it interesting. Uh, speaking of interesting, on the other side of things, Of Mice and Men have a new song out called Mushroom Cloud. And Jesus fucking Christ, this brings the absolute heavy. Uh, Defy was probably one of the worst albums I listened to last year. It was not good. It was very, very bland. Um, I loved Restoring Force. Cold World... Didn't really hit sit with me either. And like I'd, I'd pretty much given up on Off My Man, I won't lie. But then this comes out and it sounds fucking unreal. I thought because there's a, the new metal is back as well in the background. It's like full on like thrashy and groovy and like everything. It's more metallic hardcore than it is the American metalcore. And at times, I think it goes full Slipknot. It sounds immense. Uh, some previous, I can't remember off the top of my head, was, wasn't quite Restoring Force good, but still better than Defy. Probably like could have sat well on Cold World. This, though, I am very, very intrigued to find out what comes from the next of Mice and Men album. So, come on, lads, more of that. Jamie Lenman has a new song out as well, The Man of a Thousand uh, well, I've I kind of compared him to like the UK's version of Devin Townsend because he is a man of a thousand genres. He's got a new, new song out called Killer and it's taken from the Shuffle Covers, Covers album that comes out there this year. Shuffle is... Putting the word shuffle in any sentence makes things difficult. It is a cover of the Adamski Seal song that came out way back in the 90s. And on the face of it, if you, for me at least, seeing Adamski featuring Seal for a song called Killer did nothing. It didn't trigger any alarm bells, didn't twig any like long forgotten memories, nothing like that. Listening to the song though, you immediately go, oh yeah, that song. So I imagine that would be the same sort of thing again. It is a slow, crawling, industrial rock twist on the iconic song. It is iconic, literally, as soon as you put it on, you're like, oh damn, it's this one. And then it all breaks out towards the end in a typical Jamie Lennon style, everything is great kind of way. And yeah, he just sounds fucking brilliant because it's Jamie Lennon and he can do no wrong at the moment. Uh, last individual song, at least, is Oathbreaker. They are finally back. They have a new song called Ease Me and it is part of their Adult Swim Metal Comp 2. I don't want to say it. I've admittedly i've listened to it once which is unfair but i only found out about it i think yesterday it is i'm not the biggest fan i think caro still sounds amazing 
Um, it's very, it's a very hypnotic song, very oral post metal. Um, after the song finished, Car- um, Caro's vocal still stayed with me, and like they, I could still hear it in my head. So I think I just need to give it a bit more time. But if this means like that they are writing new music that will eventually come up for a new album, I think it'll be album four. I'm still gonna go for it because Raya from a few years ago was bloody brilliant. So that's it for just flat out new music. There's some new new, new music attached to new album announcements as well. Because yeah, people have been really busy this week. Where Your Wounds will start with, and they have a new album out called Rust on the Gates of Heaven. That's coming out the 12th of July. Lead singer is called The Same Thing. It's a very slow, layer building led, uh, sorry, slow, layer building song led by a piano lick and a fluttering guitar before it breaks into this big Junius esque post metal stomp. And it's got some really interesting guitar bits in there as well. It's on Death Wish, so obviously. Uh, the production sounds amazing. Where Your Wounds, if you're unfamiliar, is the side project supergroup by Jacob Bannon from Converge. It features uh, Mike McKenzie of The Red Cord, Stomach Earth, Stomach Earth and Unraveler, Adam McGrath of Cave In and Nomad Stones, Sean Martin from Twitching Tons and formerly of Hatebreed and Kid Cootie, and then Chris Maggio, formerly of Trap Them and Sleigh Bells. It's yeah, Where Your Wounds were probably the first post-metal band I ever properly looked at. Um, I ended up buying their CD, which has got some beautiful artwork on it. Because a lot of it I, won't buy. I got boring by Jacob Bannon. A lot of what Bannon did in that first Where Your Wounds song leaked over into the Converge album, which I've completely forgotten what's called. It's got, I will show you about pain. It's the one that came out a couple of years ago. Fuck you. A lot of it came through. He's really, for a man who can like scream an entire building now, he sounds so weirdly soft and tender in Where You Wound. So I think it's definitely worth looking Oh, fuck you. It's definitely worth looking into if you are a fan of that kind of music. And because it's on Death Wish, the production job on it is fucking brilliant the dusk and us that was the album i was trying to think of for converge yeah death wish it sounds incredible and yeah there we go new De- um, where you wounds album coming out middle of july and finally north wayne have a new album coming out as well that's coming out the 2nd of august lead single is called bloodlines and i'm when i first listened to it and i first heard uh little clippets of it on like instagram and just like teas and that kind of thing i really didn't like it if i'm honest um it has slowly grown on me to listen to the song in full i initially thought it sounded like a bit of a budget deft tones but marcus bridge is an incredible vocalist i think they've done really well to the vocals beforehand who i remember he had a really fun name but now i can't remember it but vocalist beforehand was brilliant in his own right to find someone as good if not better in Marcus, I think, is a testament to North Lane. I think they've been either very lucky or very, very clever. And yeah, so it saves it a fair bit. I'm going to send it a, bit, a little bit longer. I, Even though I have Mesmer on disc, I completely, again, just put it straight past. So, no, I don't have Mesmer. I had the one before that. I missed Mesmer as well. I'm just really shit with North Lane. I, yeah. Uh, be first album they've had with, or they will have, sorry, with their new bassist, Brendan Pajesek. 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 Yeah. Brendan. Uh, following the departure of Alex Milovic. Cool. That is me stumbling through all the new music. I will one day get good at this. And though I said that for... We're in episode 22 and I've said that pretty much every week. Who knows? Aaron reviews then. We're going to start with the ridiculous. Uh, it is Oakley Doakley. <laughs> Fuck's sake. Uh, the album's called Howdly Toodly. It falls on from Howdly Doodly. It, and it is, like I said, the second album. They are from Phoenix, Arizona, and they do a parody comedy style of metalcore. They are obviously a Simpsons parody metal band, all themed around Ned Flanders. They have gone viral more than once, and recently had the lead single from the debut album, White Wine Spritzer, feature on the credits of an episode of The Simpsons. So, I imagine 
maybe not name alone, but you probably would have heard of Oakley Doakley. They are headed by lead vocalist Head Ned, who has brought in an entirely new lineup from the debut, of which debut album Hardly Doodly was actually really fun. It was unexpectedly heavy in places with that disorientating like electro element throughout it all, this chaotic, like alternative metalcore kind of thing. And obviously notably it songified a lot of iconic Flanders quotes, which was just fucking batshit. But it was fun. It was a lot of fun that first album. This one though, the uh, the sophomore album is not it is not that much fun. Uh, for a project with such a baffling concept musically, it sounds quite safe. Like hold um I would even say Howdy Doodly, the the debut one is gonna be difficult between Doodly and Toodly. The debut album took more chances. Like outside of the closing song on this, which is called Folkly Doakley, because fuck. Um it all sounds rather samey and lacks a lot of that same kind of crunch and bite from the first album. And I'd say it's even it's strayed so far away from the electro metalcore sound to that to the point where it sounds a bit more like sludge metally with that still it's got an electro side to it, just not as prominent. But yeah, it's more slow pace, it's more trying to be riffy like uh sludge metal is. But I think the biggest thing that's hurt this album is the fact that most of it's like it's played most of its biggest cards early on. A lot of the iconic Flanders quotes like nothing at all, hell give me white wine spritzer, I don't even know you, but I'm sure you're a jerk. They were all used for the debut and it what's made the debut album so popular. But it's made it they've left not much behind. It's very minimal left behind for what would be the sequel album. Reen Education is a great start content wise, but it just doesn't have the backup for the rest of the album. Uh, on the musical side of things, Reen Education is again very good, as is Claw My Eyes Out and Murdered Yurdler. That's really hard to say, but it doesn't quite keep up in, with the debut album, sad to say. But I'm not going to give up on Oakley Doakley yet. Comedy acts in music are very, very hit and miss. I think the successes of bands like Steel Panther and Tenacious D are more exception than the rule. Um, my The reason why I'm not giving up on them yet is there's a Watford-based hardcore band called The Hell, who I fucking adore. They've got, I regularly wear one of their merch shirts, which is just brilliant. Um, they like swearing, they like typing things in all caps, and they like telling you you're a prick. It's great family fun. Their debut album, which was called You're Listening to the Hell, You Dick. It was, again, just absolute insanity. Bonkers music. Um, really hard, aggressive metalcore that was like air inside of like metallic hardcore kind of thing. The follow up Groove Hammer was quite mundane. I thought it was quite a boring album. There's a couple of like uh, songs from that which do pique the interest. Uh, mo one top of my head is Everybody Dies and Bangs and Mosh. But it didn't hit me first as much as the first album did, nor did the third album, which was Brutopia. And that fucking slam. Brutopia is a great album that I still listen to a lot nowadays. Um, so that's what makes me feel that there's still life yet in Oakley Doakley. They've cut, they hit it big with the debut, sort of faltered at the second, and I think third album is when they can see what worked, see what didn't work, and then they can move on and make something that will, depending on how this album takes them, either revitalize them or just keep it all moving. It's, it's, I don't know how well this is sold yet. It's really hard to buy from them because they are from Phoenix, and I don't think they have a strong distributor yet. Um, for fans of, it's hard because they market themselves, and quite rightly so, as the world's first and only Ned Flanders scene metal band. Um, I don't doubt that. I'm not going to look around to find more, but that's what it is. So it's hard to find bands like, if you like this Ned Flanders band, you'll like this other Ned Flanders band. That doesn't fucking exist. Um, if you're a fan of heavy comedy music, like I said before, The Hell, that's more 
like UK comedy, more US comedy, I'd say look at Steel Panther and Cycle Stick. Um, they are all, in between those three bands, they are all different ends of the silliness scale. Musically, I think He Is Legend, whom I only found out about through uh, searching for this one, might be completely off, but I found He Is Legend be musically quite similar to Oakley the Oakley, as is Horse the Band, which do, uh, I believe it's branded Nintendo Core. And Ni Horse the Band I'm familiar with. They're fucking batshit too, so yeah. The more comedy side of things, Psycho Stick, Steel Panther the Hell, musically, which is again an electro, metalcore, mildly sludgy kind of thing. You're looking at Horse the Band and He's Legend. If you just like The Simpsons and want people to scream lyrics at you, quotes, because I don't know what you're into, the band is Oakley Doakley. The band, the album, sorry, is Howdly Toodly. It is out now. It is ridiculous, and I think just for a bit of fun, go search out Oakley Doakley. Anyways, uh, album two this week is the sophomore band. There's a fucking hell. Why can I not decide between a band and album today? The sophomore album from I want to pronounce that, but I don't know how to pronounce. Leuven. I'm gonna stick with that. Leuven, Belgium's uh, post metal, post hardcore, post a lot of things. Brutus. Uh, the album's called Nest. The debut album Burst almost became one of the world's most overlooked albums um, were it not for a sudden influx of interest late 2017, early 2018. Had it got that initial recognition that it deserved, probably would have been seen in a lot of top 10 lists, but c'est la vie. Barely than never, Brutus quickly became one of the most excited acts in the alternative scene and the sophomore or prospective sophomore effort was highly anticipated. Uh, things began, as all things should, with a song called War, because obs. Um, it's a Taylor Two Half song, which I think I said back in when it did initially come out, because I think it was one of the first songs I covered on here. Um, the first half is a so delicate effort spearheaded by a Herculean performance from lead vocalist and dr drummer Stephanie Manertz. I'm going to try and pronounce Belgian things, so I really hope I get this right. Um, so yeah, Stephanie led the charge in the first half. It's quite an isolated uh, performance by her. And then very quickly erupts in this big, like, fast pace. It goes from punk rock into post-hardcore effortlessly. On, and it's an on, uh, there, there. onslaught, sorry, by Peter Mulders and Stane Van Helgeerden. And I think I might have nailed that. I'm really sorry if I haven't. And War on its own might be one of my favourite songs of the year. Just that the transition from calm and quiet to just an uproar, like, power. It's so good, that song. It's so fucking fun. So fucking excellent. Um, the follow-up song, Cemetery, was more of a straightforward... It was an in-your-face slab of, like, the most punk rock representation of post-rock. Um, and it almost feels confrontational... It's got like a fake laughter line followed by, no, no, sorry, preceded by It's So Funny. And just the execution of it, it's almost like it's like Brutus is trying to start a fight with you, which they might do. I've never met them. They might be mean people. Doubt they are, though. Um, together with War and Cemetery, these, song create, these songs created a, what the experts call, a buzz. Um, it was very, very exciting for the new album. And... Eventually, obviously, Nest did come out. And Nest did that most beautiful things for a post-rock heavy album. And it almost tells a story just in the music itself. It's not overly drawn out for years at a time. Um, outside of the closer, Sugar Dragon, the longest song on this album is only 4 minutes 39. Which is just, like you know, your bog standard kind of song, really. In fact, for punk rock, that's a... Sorry, for punk rock, that's a prog rock sonic. Um, and it's not like the riffs themselves are not just like one note or just like the same riff played over and over and over again until you die. Um, it's like big, heavy, like fast paced riffs that keep changing. It's drum fills, it's a scaling tremolo to really bring in that um, swelling sound in the background. It's a really sludgy bass lick for each and every song. Just on its own, that makes a brilliant album by itself. When you start including Stephanie's vocals, particularly her wails and that more high pitched stuff, it's the most high-energy post-rock album 
that genre has sounded, at least for me, who's a bit shit when it comes to post rock. Uh, highlights from the album: Horde Five just just does not stop. Uh, Steph singing and attacking the drums that fast must be an incredible thing to see live, if not just fucking fascinating. The actual breakdown sounds like you have uh, Stain strumming, um, strumming across literally every fret on the neck whilst uh, Peter just invokes a more Lemmy-esque, it's like a fat power chord bass playing, um, which anyone's ever seen like a video of Lemmy uh, compare his playing to other basses can play and it's like do 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 and then it's got him who just does not give a shit and it's power chords and it's really distorted pedal sounds incredible it's kind of what peter's doing here he's not playing bass like a traditional bassist it sounds like he's more of a rhythm guitarist than he does a bassist the song techno follows a similar kind of vein to cemetery um, in that when the snare hits across the lines of I want to dance in the big big city it makes that feel those lines those words feel so much more aggressive and so much more in your face like who are you to defy this mad last dancing like you pff, bitch she can do what she wants and you know you ain't gonna do a fucking thing and yeah I just feel as an album in general it is a very post-rock heavy album, as was Burst, the debut. But it still keeps that energy level up, which, like for me personally, as someone who's not, I've talked about before how much I'm not au fait with post-rock, it does, like, it, it just, just keep you interested and keeps you intrigued and creeps hooked. I will happily say, though, that, well, not happily, that's a word, bad word to use. I will admittedly say that Nest didn't quite sit with me the same or well, as quick as Burst did. Um, and I feel like a lot of that might be pressure from actual competent reviewers. Um, since Brutus popped up a couple of years ago, obviously a lot of people have focused in on the band and in particular uh, Stephanie's vocal style. She has a loud very powerful whale that could probably ground planes. Um, but in songs like Cemetery, Carry, Sugar Dragon, and the first half of War, they experiment outside that traditional whale. Like, for a lot of it, it's a very, very soft, very delicate kind of clean. And then in, um, I think it's Cemetery and a little bit of Carry, it's more like a down and dirty kind of punk rock snarl. And I'd love to hear more experiments like that. Particularly the snarl sort of thing where it is... I've talked about it a lot before where it's very confrontational. I think that more snarl kind of thing would be... Would add a lot more punk rock. and Which is... like I'm very biased towards post-hardcore punk rock in Bruce's Sound. Because that's what... Like the side of things I prefer. Um... But at the moment, like they have, obviously they have tried it, obviously it's in the album, but at the moment, the times where they do try this, it's very uh, few far between, it's very fleeting. Even on All Along from the uh, first album, it has a more Bark-like style, which just opens up the band more. And as a personal one, I feel Brutus have the ability to pull it off well and to incorporate more of those sort of things. And I reckon because they are that bloody good, they will still remain people won't say they've changed how they sound. It would just be, again, just adapting and expanding their sound more than changing it. Uh, for fans of, I've gone with stake number eight, Time Will Die and Love Will Bury Us, Error, Roller Tomasi, and finally, Birds in Row. If you go for any of them, if you like uh, big sounding, high energy, uh, post-rock, like post-rock that will literally kick you in the balls, um, you will do not much better than Nest, the second album from Belgian outfit Brutus. Cool. On to the last album of like your regular occurring albums. Uh, it is La Dispute with Panorama. It is their fourth album from the post hardcore group that hail from Grand Rapids, Michigan. And it's their first album with guitarist Corey Strofolino. I hope I pronounced that right. 
To me, Light Dispute occupy a space in a sort of big four of emo hardcore. Um, up there with the likes of Touche Amore, Being as an Ocean, and Pianos Become the Teeth. And from my point of view, and I might be 100% wrong, a lot of plaudits and attention primarily go to Being as an Ocean or Touche Amore. They always seem to be like still spoken about in between album cycles and tour cycles. Um, attention for La Dispute and Pianos spikes a bit with each album, but then afterwards get largely like, brushed aside, as it were. Um, and initially to the point where I was going to gloss over Panorama, because I didn't think it was going to be my kind of thing anyways. Especially when like, I did not get Stage 4 by Touche Mori. I just... I like the song Rapture, but outside of that, it just did nothing for me. And people were hailing it as like one of the best albums of, was it 2017? 2016? Uh, Waiting for Morn to Come by Being as an Ocean was enjoyable, but it took a lot of work to get into. And I didn't even know Pianos Become the Teeth released Wait for Love last year. So I just kind of thought that this was a scene that wasn't for me, which is, you know, fair enough. Uh, but this album got a lot of attention on my various social medias, and that combined with the beautiful artwork from Victor Mosquera, um, it just pulled me in and eventually convinced me to give the album a try. And it is fucking, it is a very emotional piece of music is what this is. Uh, the emotion in John Dreyer's voice, I thought, evo- uh, I thought vocal emotion peaked with Dan Campbell from... The one the years are no close to heaven from their oh God, fourth album. It came after the greatest generation. I can't remember what it's called. It was lit on my screen about 30 seconds ago. Fuck you. Um, yeah, I thought like that was the peak of what you get from a vocalist sound like he is about to burst into tears and needs a cuddle. But this fucking Jordan gives him some stiff competition, I think. The album plays more on the lines of post-rock than it does hardcore. So kind of like the opposite of what um, Brutus did a minute ago. The two-part songs of Fulton Fulton Street Part 1 and 2. It remains in that very soft ambient realm in Part 1. And then allows it to like kick the energy in and to bring up to a more hardcore side in Part 2. And it's very indicative of that post-rock thing where it's a very slow, very gradual explosion to the point where any other band or any other outfit that wanted to do like a full post-rock album, they probably would have condensed that into one song and that just would have been like a 10-minute uh, opus in, po- in post-rock. And I think it would have worked still very, very well. I'm glad they didn't because I do prefer part two to part one. And I've said to friends before um, at work talking about panorama that at times it doesn't really feel like there's songs on the album it feels more like spoken word poetry with like some music in the background to occupy space um my biggest example of this is road of night and grief it is a very slick very smooth jazz sounding song that drea pours his heart into with like a very dul- uh, dulcet spoken word delivery and I fucking love the trumpet in the background. I think it just really adds this real sexy sound to it. I don't think I've ever described music as sexy before. Probably never will again. Because it sound, feels wrong to say that word. Um, and every time I listen to it, I can't help but imagine like a 1950s noir jazz club. Like all clad in black and white here in this song. Um, despite the Spotify animations which were pretty great. And the album artwork itself. For once, I actually like the fact, again, pretty much opposite to what I was just saying about Brutus, I actually like the fact they haven't gone too much into post-hardcore and that they've stayed more in that post-rock um, hemisphere. And like I said, it feels like a more relaxed, more emo post-rock kind of album. At the times where it does pick up are still, there's still a lot of fun, don't get me wrong. Uh, Anxiety Panorama is just a fucking great song altogether. The 80s sounding synthesizing bop in the background of the verses to Footsteps at the Pond. I just so much fun. I don't know what's causing that music, but I love it. And the chord progression in There You Are, Hiding Place. It strikes me as a more like modern day interpretation of the riff from Kashmir by Led Zeppelin. 
But the res relatively sparse use of heavy elements has actually worked better here, in my opinion. And I think it does a better job of doing that than waiting for morning to come by being as an ocean. Which, I don't know that's a controversial opinion. It's mine. I'm going to keep it. Uh, before I sign this album off and move on to open mic and just say, yeah, it's a great album. Which it is a lot. It's just very, very strong album. I do really enjoy Panorama. Um... I want to give a shout out to La Dispute's drummer, Brad. La uh, there, 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 there. If I could say his fucking name, Brad van der Lute. I hope that's pronounced how you pronounce your last name, mate. Um, he is fucking gold on this. Um, I was saying before on um, Road of Night and Grief, it's a very jazz sounding song. He's got a very like jazz beat throughout the entire album, and I think it's fucking great. He's done a great job on here. And I also want to shout out to the producer, Will Yip who is very quickly becoming a sign of quality in music for me. Um, over the past 10 years, he has worked with Wicker Face, Springs Eternal, uh, Code Orange, Turnstile, The Menzingers, Balance of Composure, Title Fight, Touche Mori. He is, at the moment, the fucking man. And, yeah, I think he's done, a, a, again, a very excellent job on this. And, yeah, I've... Producers and that kind of thing and mixes and, you know, the background staff of an album is something that I don't really look into that much. So I feel for me to notice a recurring theme of seeing Will Yip's name screams volumes about him and what he can do as a producer. So, yeah, Will Yip and, like I said, drummer Brad Van der Lucht, Lucht, I'm really sorry. They've both done a great job, as has everyone else on La Dispute. Fucking fantastic album. If you are a fan of Being as an Ocean, uh, piano, Pianos Become the Teeth, or Me Without You, go check this out. A very ambient, very, very emo uh, style of post-rock. The album's called Panorama, the band's called Loudest Dispute. They hail from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and yeah, I think you should listen to it, because I said so. Open mic for this week, then. This is, I've literally just finished writing the review for it. Uh, Grave Times was the album name. It came out in 2011, and the band was The Defiled. Um, they do a industrial twinged groove metal twinged metalcore. Uh, this was their debut album. They come from London, and it came after the release of a very well received EP called 1888. Um, at this point in their career, The Defiled consisted of Stitch D on lead vocals and guitar. The AVD on synthesizer and backing vocals, Aaron Curse on guitars, Vincent Hyde on bass, and JC Brutal on drums. And their imagery, their names, and just uh, a lot of sound as well was inspired by the very 90s gothic industrial phase that happened at the time. So you're looking at, I think the biggest comparison would be Marilyn Manson. And I'll go into a little bit later about the imagery of everything because it did play a huge part in it. Um, I remember getting Grave Times free with a copy of Metal Hammer in what I have now dubbed unofficially the Metal Hammer era, whereby all the music I ingested or got into in those years pretty much primarily came from that magazine. Um, and this would have been quite early on too. So this probably would have been the very first band from this newly dubbed era of me ingesting music the industrial well the industrial metalcore kind of thing has been attempted a number of times i think fear factory laid the foundations of what it should sound like and what can be done when they did like an industrial groove industrial death metal um output of the years and then ba bands like nemec uh, Motionless and White, The Interbeing, Cybreed, they've all tried to really usher in like a modern take of that sound over the years. But with the exception of Motionless, Motionless and White, it never really took off in the same kind of way. So for The Defiled to come in, uh, relatively out of nowhere as well, with a very... They had the groove of Fear Factory, the grind and melody of Metalcore, and a very dark synth uh, element in the background. To combine those things together, to do it really well, kind of affirm that the UK has something very, very special at the time. Uh, you've got the Brave 
seven minute opener in in the land of fools and in that you've got the band showing off their core sound musically combining all the things i just talked about and vocally as well they've got a two-pronged vocal attack um obviously stitch fronting the helm but you've got the abd in the background where instead of like juxtaposing each other which what a lot of metalcore bands do they attack things at the same time quite a lot of time so by that i mean uh, they'll do dual cleans or they'll do dual screams and harsh vocals to really like accentuate a sound and to really um, like usher in that mood and that heaviness or that softness depending on what they're going to go for at the time for me the three song salvo afterwards of Call to Arms, Blood Cells and Black Death that's what drew me in to the album um, along with I guess, well, in those songs you've got the Stampede drum beat you've got the chugging wrist backed up by that sinister electro backing um, which on the pre-chorus to black death sounds like the march of a cyber goth funeral it sounds fucking great um following that again a three song blast from metropolis locked in freedom and the ill disposed if those first three songs drew me in these three songs kept me invested and kept me in for the album um Metropolis has Stitch pushing his cleans to the absolute edge and he hands him like a fucking Don. It's between that and Call to Arms where Stitch is at his best. Uh, Locked in Freedom potentially has one of my favourite riffs from the entire album and a lot of that is to do with the... What's it? What's it good? The alignment as well, there we go, with the synthesizer as well from the ABD. And everything is all cacked off by a very dark, industrial, borderline folk song called Final Sleep, which is horrifically unsettling and it's at the same time brilliant. It's a really chilled song that I still listen to today where you can just sort of like put it on and just like relax, which probably wasn't what was attended, but when you're a big goth emo boy, that's what you enjoy doing. It is... It is by, mo by no means a perfect release. The metalcore bots are still very metalcore. Um, the Resurrectionists and In Your Name are both fairly uneventful. And in general, In the Land of Fools didn't hit me as hard as it seemed to hit everyone else. Um, but it was a, a significant album for me. Like I said, it's one of the first um, albums from that time period that really stuck with me and really, like, well, still now sticks with me. And over the past couple of months, I've been able to talk about them a lot. I writing about them a little bit in a What Culture article. I've spoken to a little bit online and to friends at work. And yeah, it was just cool to rediscover this band and this album. Um, and in doing Grave Times, I've been able to rediscover quotes that they made at the time that I absolutely love when they were promoting the album. Um, so nowadays i don't see it as much but people people will still do it don't get me wrong but people back then really judged a band based on what they looked like before anything else they didn't have to listen to a single note of music they looked at you they looked at bleed from within and thought they were going to be a very cookie cutter metalcore band just because he had the same hair as ollie sykes for fuck's sake and instead they are a fucking overtly brutal deathcore band um and the same thing happened with The Defiled. They got pretty much written off straight away just because they had big hair. They wore makeup and had very, like... They really tapped into that industrial look. So they had... Um, I don't even know how to describe it. Like, tan leather vests and a lot of scarves, ripped jeans, that kind of thing. They, they did look... They did have a certain look. Um, and at this time, because people writing them off straight away i believe it was the avd um who said it and it was that the defiled were too goth for metal but too metal for goth and as someone who fell in love with the imagery of this band it really really stuck because like i said the whole that's not metal thing was so strong at the time and looking at posts on scars and metal hammer and just online in general it was so frustrating to see bands written off just because of what they sounded like, or sorry, what they looked like as opposed to what they sounded like. Um, 
so following on from Grave Times, they released album two called Daggers two years later in 2013, um, along with New Drum and Needles. I would say I prefer Daggers. In fact, I would go as far to say it is so much better. Don't know why I was thinking that was going to be controversial. It's, it is just better. They really tapped into everything that was good about Grave Times and made it better in Daggers and just got rid of all like the very generic shit. And so after Daggers, they had a huge ton of momentum. They got a Jägermeister to sponsor. They're in the Guinness World, World Book of Records. They signed with Nuclear Blast. So you can imagine how fucked off I was when they split up in 2016. Um, there was a long-winded explanation on Facebook, but I'll just give you the really, really important lines of it is with heavy blackened hearts that we inform you that the time has come to lay the defile to rest. There is no drama or fallout, but we have been forced to face the reality that the love of what we do is not enough to keep our black ship sailing. The continuation of the defiled has become logistically, stroke financially, untenable. And I distinctly remember at the time someone questioned us at why is it that bands like you can't stick around, but then some shit like whatever pop star was big at the time can. I believe it was the AVD again who just said, their parents have more money than Wiles did. And if that's just not the most sickening thing, it's deeply cynical as well. I'll happily relate. But, the fuck, dude? So after Grave Times and after the, Defi after the Daggers and, well, actually, yeah, after the Defiled, um, various members of the band have gone on to do various different things. So you've got Stitch, who's going by Lee Villain now. He is in a band called Low Lives, who's also made up of members of Amen, No Devotion, and the Antares. Uh, their debut album came out last year. Um, the AVD, Alex Avdis, um, he's in a new band called Red Method, who primarily composed of members of Metastasis. Uh, Vincent Hyde, I believe, went on to make a custom leather brand, although he seems to have fallen off the face of the social media world. Needles was recently seen uh, drumming for Aaron Buchanan and the Cult Classics, um, best friends of our podcast. And then finally, Aaron Kerris, he left before the band split up. He left just after Daggers in 2014. And I can't find anything. He's gone, again, quite dark on social media and just the internet in general. So he hasn't really popped up in anything that I'm aware of. So who knows? For fans of, of the album in general, uh, I've said about them a lot, but Fear Factory, Nemec as well, and Mid-Era, sort of, There Is A Hell. More well, There Is A Hell, actually, and Suicide Season, Era, Bring Me The Horizon, for at least grave times i think i'd give them a go because they were brilliant the defile i'm so unhappy that they split up i still am a bit resentful that they split up daggers is a lot better i'll concede but it all started with grave times and yeah i think at one point i think still mildly now i would happily have their logo tattooed on me on, on me on me somewhere um but there we are. Bands break up. We all cry. We all move on. Kind of. So that was episode 22 of the Desolation Sounds podcast. I sped through that because I thought I had less time. But what do you know? Uh, feel free to get in contact with me over social media in every such possible way you can. Because I exist everywhere. It's a drag. But until next time, I don't know what's coming. Just have to it'll be a surprise for all of us. Enjoy the rest of your week, guys. And I'll see you soon. Bye.